opportunity to open with an initial question, um, which I'll just say from here, and then Ross, if you don't mind starting. Um, I've asked each of them to think a little bit about how they define polarization, because it's so important, I think, that when we come together, we actually define terms. We all mean something a little different, even if we have a basic understanding of the is 
disembodied conversation. We're having conversations about something that we're actually feeling, but we're trying to do it, cutting ourselves off right here. Um, and so I would just like to see a show of hands. If I say polarization or we're so divided in this country, can you just raise your hand if that makes you feel something? Anxious, tight in your throat, every single person. And so, if you, not you, I, I don't think it's <laughs> uh, And that doesn't mean we're both. Um, but, but so, I guess it's, it depends on the stakeholders. It depends on, um, you know, what the discussion of the topic means to us individually. We each have a story. But we all have a nervous system. And uh, I will touch on this a little bit. There is a sort of physiology to polarization. Polarization is fueled uh, by certain factors and drivers. Um, but polarization is missing a few things. And I think part of what we end up probably talking about toward the end in terms of um, some of the recommendations for pathways for change that we all offer um, is how we can actually look at what polarization is lacking and kind of reverse engineer it. So polarization to me is lacking curiosity. And Curiosity actually promotes neuroplasticity. So a curious brain is growing really. You, you develop more dense neural networks when you ask questions. Polarization lacks reflection, right? A reflection of curiosity. Um, cur polarization lacks flexibility. And when you when you look at sort of what, what's deeper in that, polarization as an experience or as a response is a response to perceived threat. And we're built for that. So our brains are both wired for love, affiliation, and cooperation, and trust, but we are so wired for threat and fear. And if our threat fear detection system is activated, uh, love and connection go to the, not just the back burner, but get shut down. So does novelty, so does curiosity. So a polarized um, country is a country in survival mode. And a polarized media is a media that isn't really able to think straight. Much as a lot of people in the media like to think that they're giving the news, the truth, and the object, there is no way to get to that as long as nervous systems are dysregulated and fingers are ready to point to the other side. Um, and polarization lacks empathy. It's missing empathy. And so it's, it's you know, we talk a lot about um, unity and bridging the divide. So how does each quote unquote side or echo chamber that's becoming more and more medically sealed in this country, how does each quote side or each identity begin to question what is polarizing such that they might think, well, instead of building scaffolding for a more polarized worldview that is weaponized to continue to polarize society, how do we build scaffolding for resilience? How do we build scaffolding for communities to begin at local grassroots levels? Questioning what the underlying needs are driving the conversation. So, touch more on that in the media ecosystem in a minute. I'll pass it on to Dr. Sherman. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so, the question how do you define polarization? I want to back up and start to talk about our democracy in this country, our Constitution, and the First Amendment, because each of these documents, or each of these frameworks, is helping us think about. How do we structure our society, given that we come with different identities and experiences? And so one definition of polarization that's in the literature is issue polarization. We all have different experiences. We think differently about different issues. Issue polarization isn't really a problem when we have a democracy, when we have a constitutional right for freedom of speech, and we can speak out of our identity and our experience about our different beliefs. What is problematic, just as Lou has just said, is affect polarization, this emotional polarization where uh, we actually almost deny each other the freedom of speech and say, I disagree with your belief and I don't want to hear you say it. Um, so there have been a number of surveys recently about this concept of political correctness because it's become a very politically divided term. <laughs> and on the one hand, I think part of our national conversation is that everybody doesn't feel heard. And so nobody wants to be shut down. And so the reaction against political 
degrading to other people, say, hey, but you're, I want to say what you're saying hurts me. What you're saying is articulated in a way that undermines my humanity. And I think this is really what we have to struggle with in terms of polarization, that everybody wants to be heard, and we have to find a way to um, communicate with each other that protects the First Amendment rights we all have to speak out of our experience and our belief, but also the responsibility to see the humanity and the dignity of every person in our society. We have to structure a society where speech is, is challenged if it's degrading and dehumanizing. So I'll leave it for that. I, I appreciate it, and I think anyone can jump in on this. I appreciate that you all opened Mark, and look at can you guys hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay. I appreciated that you all opened um, with a sense of what does this mean from my personal experience and to individuals. And we'll get to, and I, I love how Lisa brought in um, democracy as a mediating factor. But I wonder if you could start by talking about the role of polarization and how it impacts individuals. Because first and foremost, we're all human. And we know that, I love that this already came up, that we talked about intellectual polarization, issue polarization. Um, Lou touched on the somatic, the bodily response we have, the neurobiological response we have. So I wonder, and if any of you can jump in, if you could just reflect a little bit on, in your work or in your own experiences, how have you seen polarization impact individuals, whether it's physically, socially, emotionally, spiritually, or even you know, vocationally or identity-wise? Um, so in the higher ed space, what I see is people getting a worse education um, because of polarization. Um, we, we at Bridge call it the, the politicization of intellect. So recently for me, I was in a class called Music in American Cultures, um, and we were talking about, the teacher was talking about how you know, race is purely a social construct. And then I went to my discussion section, and the teaching assistant said, I don't believe that race is a social construct. And here I am in a class where I'm supposed to be learning, and both people are claiming truth, right? You say, this is truth. Um, I ended up writing that it was a social construct because someone's grading my paper and I want to get a good grade. Okay? But that's fundamentally a problem, right? If we're paying thousands of dollars to go to a class to regurgitate someone's personal beliefs, then we're not learning. Um, and if you're being presented truth um, without any counterpoint, then we're not becoming as educated as we can be. And I think that's a really big problem. The second, and it's more of a problem with my generation, um, is apathy. Um, I don't know how, how many of you have seen Schoolhouse Rock, um, the videos, right? The, the teaching things. Um, and I remember specifically the one about how does a law, how does a bill become a law, right? I said, oh, you know, go to the House of Representatives and to the Senate and then the President, you know. And we, um, as political actors, woke up into a world where all you hear is hateful rhetoric. You see filibustering for days on end, right? Nothing's being passed. There are these giant bills that are not related to one another at all. Um, nothing's really getting done, and everyone's yelling at each other. And so, you know, if something was getting done and people were angry, then maybe that's a good thing, right? If people were nice to each other but nothing was getting done, maybe you'd want to involve yourself. But people in my generation just see, well, everyone hates each other and yells at each other and nothing gets done. And why would you, why would you involve yourself in that? So people are also becoming just don't want to be political actors. That's so interesting. Uh, I read a statistic that 61% of millennials get their news through their phone. Uh, can I ask where you get your news? Who gets their news by watching television? The big networks or the local? Uh, who gets their news by reading um, a physical news 
newspaper where they're turning pages. Um, and what about reading news online? The majority. Um, who here digs a little deeper when they read a story and they want to cross-reference it and read something else and just kind of like do their homework on it? And can I ask one last question about that? Uh, who gets their news from the same source every single day? One source, one viewpoint. Um, I just want to touch just for a moment on um, this broad umbrella term of media. It's like about media, right? It's like climate. It's like it's, it media has become this giant, unwieldy word. But where we are now with the proliferation of uh, multimedia and the millions of ways in which we can source things, um, the sort of mainstream media are losing viewers because there are a lot of other ways to, to find out about things. And we have a lot of citizen-produced media. We have a lot of people writing blogs and opinions, etc. It's interesting to me, Ross, when you when I hear you say everybody's yelling at each other and nobody's listening. Well, because we can't. Because when we're yelling at each other, by the way, we can yell silently. Yeah. Right? You just have to have people pass you by in the car and see the bumper stickers and who they vote for. And some people are like, I'm not letting you in, right? And so there, there's a sense in everybody that there are ways to polarize, even though we make it look neat and tidy, there are messy ways to polarize. But this idea of screaming at each other, how many people have turned on the TV? And it's a screaming match. Mm -hmm. We don't like we don't like this, you know, and somehow there's a perception um, among <coughs> Because I think we, we, we conflate anchors and producers. And we conflate anchors, producers, and shareholders. I mean, media has become corporatized. Um, media is beholden to corporate interests. And so one of my questions is the oxymoron of freedom of the press. Because I have a number of colleagues who are exhausted working for a number of these media outlets. And it is a groundhog day of iterative reporting that they can't get off that treadmill. And it's not, they can't say, well, I don't think we should cover the story this way. I think one of the things we talk about polarization in the media that is lacking, um, if I might offer, is context. Is, is if we can have a more contextualized understanding of stories, why certain stories are chosen, why certain stories are not linked to other sort of broader dynamics and frames of understanding. Um, and then what's our choice as an audience? So there's free speech, there's freedom of expression, but is there a free audience? If we are being triggered constantly in sort of our limbic system and we're reacting to what we're seeing and it's all about clicks and likes, we still have a choice as news consumers of whether we want to push back on that or demand something a little bit different, get something more probative, ask deeper questions. You know, who are the guests that we keep seeing on air and what is the goal? And I might, before I pass it on to Lisa, I might just offer too, I mean, when we think about this media ecosystem that has become so entrenched and embedded, I, I, I might put it out there and say polarization is the design model. And it is a kind of for-profit model. And so to the extent that we're an audience um, sinking into a depressive state, watching the state of affairs, which is probably just look like looking through a straw at that particular viewpoint, um, I might say it depends on your lens. So I think what we're doing here is looking through multiple lenses. I think we need to demand the same of the media whoever they are, whatever they are, and to reward the, those media outlets with our approval when we say thank you for a wider lens of the story. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So I want to bridge here. So you didn't ask about national public radio, which is where I get most of my news. <laughs> and that's because they are really committed to giving multiple voices and, and multiple sides of the story. And this is the most important thing about a free media and you'll find it in, around the world with the BBC and I think with NPR, this commitment to giving context, to featuring 
voices from across the aisle and all different parts of society. And I think all of us as we're consuming our news need to be thinking about those journalistic principles of how we protect our society by listening to people in all different spaces. Um, I work mostly on technology and democracy and social cohesion, which is the opposite of polarization. So I wanna feature three analytical pieces about why technology, in particular social media, is fueling the polarization in this country. The first is what Lou mentioned, there's an economic model here. At Harvard, there's a professor there who wrote a book called Surveillance Capitalism. It's about the whole economic model of social media, which is to gather the private data from all of us to be able to sell that to advertisers so they can find out who in the audience wants to buy a specific kind of shoe or car. Um, but Facebook now has the largest computer in the world, and that's because they have an individual profile on each one of us, e even if we don't have a Facebook account. If somebody in the household using that computer does, they're tracking all of the activity on the computer. Um, so this idea that our private location, likes, friends, everything that we're doing on the internet is being collected so that that information can be sold to advertisers poses a whole range of problems, as you've seen in Congress, as, the, as we're trying to get a sense of the extreme amount of power these corporations like Facebook and Twitter have because of this information. Um, what that means is those companies, the, the social media companies, want us to stay on their platforms as long as possible to gather the most data from us. And so they have done a lot of work to make their platforms as addictive as possible. So this um, addiction sort of, of, of getting our attention um, often by the, the liking bus button. So they call it affirmation addiction. We post something, we watch to see who likes it, and it's, it's become a very strange new psychological dynamic where we're all trying to get attention and affirmation from people and by posting things and sharing things. And so that sort of that dynamic of what's happening in the space of technology companies and neuroscience and how uh, some in Silicon Valley talk about it as hacking our brains to kind of get into us and it obviously raises privacy concerns, you know, sort of we're getting our news from the web because we're spending so much time on our phones um, and my children and Instagram. It's just a, a tremendous challenge to get them away from this very addictive box that, that is carried around all day. The second conversation about technology is uh, really having to do with this First Amendment and the freedom of speech. So, now we have companies who are being challenged, particularly about violent extremism and hate speech. How are they going to regulate that? And they call it deplatforming, so taking somebody off. But the bigger issue is what is now being called the freedom of reach. So we need to protect the freedom of speech, but these companies do not have the right to formulate their algorithms to spread disinformation and hate speech. And the prime example of this has actually been about YouTube and YouTube's algorithm. So these are the mathematical calculations of how they're going to show each one of us a specific list of recommended videos. So 70% of the videos watched on YouTube are, are watched on that recommended list. So you go to find one video and then they tell you the next 10 that you should watch. And a lot of us keep clicking away <laughs> at that recommended list. Um, and what has been found consistently across issues with YouTube is they show and recommend the most extreme conspiracy theories. So if you look up dieting, they're gonna recommend 10 videos on how to be an anorexic person. If you look up 9-11, it's, it's um, recommendations on conspiracy theories of 9-11 never happened. Uh, it's, and this continues on on many themes. And so there's been this challenge. Okay, YouTube, people have the right to post their political point of view, 
but YouTube does not have the right, the freedom of reach to amplify things that are false and harmful to our society by seeding disinformation and conspiracy theories. Um, so then the third thing is, okay, so these companies, these technology companies are trying to figure out what to do on freedom of speech. They wanna protect freedom of speech, but a lot of what's being shared on social media is very hateful and degrading and threatening. Um, so across the political spectrum, again, uh, people have been deplatformed, um, and both the right and the left wing in this country are screaming, hey, this, you're violating my freedom of speech by deplatforming me. Um, so they've put a lot, Facebook and Twitter has put, have put a lot of time thinking about this, but the reality is there's, we're, these companies have such powerful um, shaping powers on society and African-American activists are being deplatformed because they are talking about racism, their personal experience, right? So it's like, and right-wing activists are also being deplatformed, but how do we compare and contrast what speech we're going to say is okay and what's not okay? Um, and really do we want a few people, like less than a thousand people sit in Silicon Valley making these decisions. So it's, a, it's like an entire other government in the West Coast deciding what the public discourse is going to be like. And how is our democracy going to work when there's people there who are not elected or <laughs> reflecting our wishes at all, making decisions to deplatform some speech and not others? Hi, Hi, Lou. I wonder Hi. if um, the, in this really good conversation that all three of you have touched on, um, or Dr. Sherko had, um, if one of you could just give a little bit of context for the way in which we engage with media consumption now in 2019, almost 2020, it is very different than the way we did even 20 years ago as a society and the ways in which we've, we've always had some levels of pluralism in a positive sense or polarization in a negative sense in America. But um, for those of us that are not um, media historians, I wonder if uh, any of you could jump in about the context for how uh, media production and consumption has changed in the last 50 years in this country. Oh, wow. I mean, I, I can touch on some of it. I'm sure that we will all have something to say on that. I mean, 50 years ago, that's light years away, right? Even in the last, say, 2009, till, from 2009, let's just say, from the time the iPhone was born, um, when sort of everybody was on the internet, right? That's a very recent thing. It's a very young thing. Um, so we have virality and velocity of messaging. That, that, that's something that didn't exist. You know, you can't put up flyers as fast as you can get a, a meme to travel around the globe 10 times. Um, I think that's such an interesting question. I think um, when it used to be that media was um, a more simple model and certainly there was less choice, uh, it was a whole different ball game. But now that uh, we have more choice than is actually healthy for us, we have so much cognitive dissonance, we don't know where to get the news. There's a kind of scattered, chaotic way of patching together what's happening. Um, because uh, newsrooms are tasked with the, I think, impossible task, and this is what part of what we're seeing as an outcome, of keeping up with things, I think there's a race to be first to get news out sometimes before it's vetted and sometimes we have uh, corrections that have to be made. But we also know that the incorrect thing that came out has a sticking power and is sticky. And that sensationalized race to get that headline out, I mean, everything's breaking news. Everything's breaking news, which was yesterday's breaking news of sending troops to Saudi Arabia. But you could also have breaking news uh, Nancy Pelosi slams such and such as opinion. That's not the same. So everything becomes flatlined. I think that's part of what happens on that. Um, and also I think because there's so much on the landscape, 
uh, that's that's grabbing our attention in in what uh, many people term the attention economy. We simply can't split our attention that way. Um, it's a little like multitasking. We're not good at it. And the more confused we become, the more activated, the more uh, dysregulated we become just as people trying to get through the day, um, we are not able to make good decisions about, uh, about what we think is accurate or about what we need. And we fall into a kind of learned helplessness. And there's some really interesting pieces out about, look, democracy is hard work. We all know that. But there's some really interesting pieces out. Certainly, I was just reading uh, Sean Rosenberg, who's a political scientist um, who works at UCI. And, and he kind of riled up an audience recently at one of his conferences saying that he thinks democracy is coming to an end. And everybody in the audience was, how can you say that in such a defeatist way? And he was saying, look, unless we're willing to do the hard work, it's not going to last. Because the more we have authoritarian governments um, and sort of this populist movement rising around the world and in this country, um, exhausted citizens want simple solutions. And if a simple solution is, just give me your loyalty. I'll tell you what to do, just give me your loyalty. Then more and more citizens kind of fall, get lulled into that. And when Ross talks about apathy, I kind of think it's, y'all heard of fight, flight, freeze? I kind of think apathy is the nervous system's freeze mode. So we have to wake up from that as people and say, I don't want to be in freeze mode. I don't want to be in fight mode, and I don't want to be in flight mode. I want to be engaged, and to do that, I have to be calm so I can think straight. Yeah, I, I'd like to comment on this history of media because I think actually how the, the evolution of how we get our news is really affecting polarization. Um, so I've worked in Afghanistan and Iraq and many other countries across Africa looking at the media systems and how they work and what our media assistance program was, particularly in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it's actually very concerning because what we know about the history of media is that when people listen to different sources of news that are, are featuring primarily one point of view or one set of experiences, society becomes more polarized. And I think deeply we can trace the history of polarization in this country to people watching the mainstream networks less and CNBC and Fox News more. So the left and the right are getting different stories of what is happening, different an analysis and opinion about what's happening. So what concerns me about both Afghanistan and Iraq is that when we were built, so their media systems pretty much collapsed during the wars. And then as they were build, being built up, instead of building one national media TV uh, news station, they really developed, they, money was given to different ethnic groups to build their own media systems. So in Afghanistan, there is a Tajik, an Uzbek, a Pashtun TV station, newspaper. This does not help. Uh, so I've worked a lot in Afghanistan in designing the peace process since 2009 to present, working with the Taliban and civil society and the government to try to figure out. And without a media station that is giving people news and information and diverse opinions from across the political spectrum and across the ethnic spectrum, we can't build peace. People have such different understandings of what's happening and such a lack of empathy and understanding for other points of view. We, we can't build a democracy in Afghanistan and we can't restore and renew our democracy in this country when we are listening to different stories and not hearing across the aisle and across different states and positions in society. I, I, go ahead, and then I have one thing I wanted to ask, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't feel incredibly qualified to talk about the history of media, given that I'm 21 years old. But um, <laughs> uh, I think there is something to be said as well for um, a 24-hour news cycle, a constant stream of news, and that channel gaining revenue from advertising, right? If you start self-selecting or selecting viewers, you know, the way that you run ads, right, is to provide a certain set of content 
to understand what kind of person that content draws and what kind of things that that person buys. Um, and so if you can start selecting harder for specific ideologies and people, um, then you can sell more things, right? Um, and I believe the way the news worked a lot of times were more hourly updates, right? Or a section, a segment at night, and then the channel was doing something else for the day. But if you're constantly selling ad space to people, you're going to want to have a specific type of people there that you can say, look, our audience is 25 to 40, you know, white liberal people. You can sell a lot more once you know that that information. I think that's that's an important distinction. And not something I don't I don't think we can get away from. I mean, our, our phones are our own 24 hour news cycles now. Um, I don't know if there's a, a very immediate way forward. I think that um, we the people have a lot more power than we think we do. And it's because if they're all, all of the people producing the news and all of us who are consuming the news, and maybe some of us are, are producing news as well, um, they just all want us so badly. <laughs> they need our eyeballs and they need us to comment and share. So they're desperate for uh, us as an audience. I think for us to be a discerning audience, we have to ask ourselves, are we losing skills to distinguish between what is news and what isn't? Are we losing these skills? So how do we actively practice these skills? The other thing too is that, um, and Lisa knows this work so deeply from her work around the world um, and from the, the, some of the research that I've been doing recently on conflict, polarization goes hand in hand with dehumanization. You know, when we're, by the time we're polarized, um, we don't much care about the other person. And so I think that dehumanization message is really, really important. I also think it's interesting that um, where the media doesn't potentially uh, all intentionally try to create a dehumanizing rhetoric, uh, I don't know if you watched the third debate, but during the debate on many of the ABC stations, uh, there was an ad run by a, a GOP PAC uh, um, group uh, where AOC's uh, photo was burned with fire around it. Did anybody see this? So it was a photo of uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. It was her co congresswoman photo, right, her smiling face. And the moment the ad starts, the fire starts burning around her face. And in the middle of her face, uh, it dissolves to the Cambodian genocide. And the context for this is that socialism is dangerous and this woman is dangerous. And so that is an alarming ad, but why did it run? And so the next day, CNN has not the, not the people who ran the ad, but the person who narrated the ad. And so the question then, as we're watching to be discerning, we have to ask, why am I watching this? What am I learning from this? Um, but also an interesting neuroscientist in Philadelphia just discovered in the last couple of years that dehumanization and dislike have two different regions of the brain. So you can dislike somebody, but not dehumanize them. You can also dehumanize a whole group and not necessarily dislike them if you were riding the elevator with somebody. So this is important when we're designing interventions. If we're gonna design an intervention and we think it's just all about getting people to like each other, we've missed the boat if really what's happening is a profound de dehumanization. Um, yeah. I wanna, I wanna open it up to questions from the audience. Um, and, uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Cool. Okay. Hi, I'm Yael Swerdlow. I'm a recovering photojournalist, um, <laughs> although we never recover, actually. Um, and so, and I've also trained others in media literacy. And one of the things that is missing is the understanding of media language that protects them. So, if we're if if the word unsubstantiated, unconfirmed, 
and all of those, and, and, and the listening public doesn't understand what that means, then they're taking everything as fact when in reality it may not be. So there has to be an education process of folks to be discerning and in terms of the, if you will, cover your ass language that the media uses to protect itself from spreading false information. That's an excellent point. Um, that, that's the alleged, right? The allegedly. Unconfirmed, unconfirmed allegedly, uh, yeah. unsubstantiated. Yes, I, I think because our ears are primed for conflict and fear in this landscape, um, we skip over all of those things as an audience and we just say, right. Um, so I think one thing that I also want us to, I guess, att tune our ears to is, you know, just much like if there was a radio station and it's static, I mean, you want to clarify it, you want it to, to tune in. So if you really want to tune in, what is the language that you often see as that lower third or what we call in television the chiron? What are the verbs? Just this week as you're watching, you will see the verbs rips, slams, tears, shreds. Um, you know, these are ones you see typically a lot. Uh, blasts, that's another word they like. Um, and the tenor of that language is it's battle language. It's war language. It's uh, the language of conflict. And I think you talked about the 24-7 news cycle. The former head of CBS, who fell from grace, Les Moonves, at the beginning of the 2016 election, sort of the campaign cycle, he was caught with a mic in his, uh, in his, in his face, basically. What do you think of what's happening, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, look, this may be bad for the country, but it's great for ratings. And he, he kind of pulled back the curtain and said what nobody would have dared say before. So cat's out of the bag. It's great for ratings, but they only get ratings because we watch. And so if we watch differently and if we demand something different because we're educated, like Yael said, um, we can shape the news according to what we really do need. But we all have to be able to see what's happening. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and partly to what Lou said earlier about are we losing the ability to discern what is good news, right? The, uh, the counter response is are we teaching that ability to, to, our, to our kids, right? Um, but especially on what you said, I think uh, a very important part of this is kind of uh, de-politicizing or making more, more neutral the idea of fake news. And that, because it's really easy in this day and age to believe, and a lot of people in this room, maybe even myself, will feel like the, their opposites are the, are the ones really perpetuating fake news, right? My side isn't doing the fake news, the other side's doing the fake news, right? Um, the reality is it's on both sides, um, but I think people find it hard to educate about it because no one's willing to think that their side might be propagating fake news. So I think we need to really consciously realize that we're doing that and train our kids and train ourselves to look for what fake news is or what unsubstantiated news is. Can someone bring this gentleman a mic? To me, uh, oh, my name is Bill Cleveland. Um, to me, polarization is indoctrinization. And what I mean by that is, I went to a meeting last week and I was going to talk to some young people about helping me in the campaign. And as I went to the meeting, uh, what the people were saying was this, the Republicans are trying to take the black vote away. And I'm sitting in here and I'm going, because this lady says that she had a, her, her new driver's license and it has to have a star in the corner. And then all of the things that she had to do was have her birth certificate, her marriage license, um, uh, and a certificate that she lives in a certain address. She says the Republicans are doing that to you. 
and we need you young people to rise up because those Republicans are bad. And I just raised my hand and they, well, I said, listen, the Republicans aren't doing that to you. I said, listen, this is September. You remember September the 11th? And three of the hijackers had Virginia's driver's licenses. And with those driver's licenses, it's the key to everything. If you want to get a, a, a bus license or whatsoever, and you can, get, uh, you can go in to learn how to fly planes. So the man interrupted me and said, well, they got their, uh, uh, their, their pilot's license. I said, no, they never got their pilot's license. The only thing they wanted to do was learn how to take off, how to, how to fly to where they want to, and then they fly into a building. They never, they never uh, went on. Then they turned it around and they said, okay, oh, it was about 9-11. said, but it's, it's the thing that they were indoctrinating young people to go out to do something else that was wrong. Well, I would say to me that was wrong with the bad, with bad information, and that's being done on, uh, uh, being done on a, on a, a, a low level. So to me, polarization is indoctrination, and it makes sense for people to have both sides of the view. Because if you don't, you're going to get other people up. And then I'm going to, I'm going to be quiet with this. Okay. Um, I do a lot of things on history, and when you talk about the history of uh, uh, of um, uh, uh, of the media, people way back when were doing things in the 1930s when TV, I'm mean, not with TV, when, when movies or documentaries were out, and I was doing a documentary on an African American, and and uh, and I was listening to a documentary on African American, and then comes into it was. This person did so and so and so and so. It wasn't from that. From from that, it was it was uh, it was like uh, uh, someone else on the outside was coming into this and saying, "Well, look, because you're seeing this, this this other thing happened." That's not what I'm there for. So I filtered that out to really get the information that I really needed. So I'm sorry to make it so long, but. Polarization is indoctrinating. Uh, so, did you have a question? Did you want the, pol the panelists to respond to a question? Okay, that uh, to me that that is the uh, 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 the essence of what I once. Young people are being indoctrinated with not the full information. That's that's the thing that I. Did anyone want to respond? Okay. Um, can you, yeah, I'm gonna just set a couple, uh, because I think Steve is gonna let us go till 1245, so if anyone needs to, uh, we're gonna go in this in this panel until 1245, according to his text message. Um, so if you need to take care of your own biological needs, go ahead and come back. Um, I also just want to uh, frame up, so we have about, uh, 19 minutes, sorry, not a math major, uh, lawyer, but not a math major. And uh, I, I want to get as many questions in as possible. So if when you ask a question, I should have said this from the start, if you could just say your name and if you want to identify yourself with any, like why you're here, um, and then uh, ask your question and tr try to, even if you have a little bit of commentary, try to ask your question in a way that um, our panelists can be responsive because we have such great experts up here and I really want to make sure we're hearing from them during this time. Great. Um, my name's Sylvia Standard and I'm interested in what particularly you think about how to change the media to get them to be more, I, I watch so many Sunday morning talk shows and a couple of them are very good and show both sides, but there's so many that just no matter what a Republican does, they're wrong, they're horrible, they're evil, blah, 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 blah. You know, and then flip side on Fox, it's the same thing. All Democrats are evil, bad, horrible, trying to take away your rights. And it, neither is true. You know, it's, so how do we get the, the media themselves to sort of flip the switch a little bit and become more unpolarizing? Um, thank you so much. Hmm. There's no simple answer to that. Uh, also because, um, okay, you're a viewer and you're watching it. You know what you like and you know what you turn off. Um, some of it's feedback. And um, good news organizations have a vested interest 
in understanding what it is that turns you off. And so if you use your voice, freedom uh, of your own opinion, basically, to let them know, and that is through all the different venues, through social media, et cetera. There are people who have, you know, there are departments in each of these uh, organizations that are dedicated just to that. The other piece of it is, um, you know, understanding that news organizations and um, especially the very large, I mean, local news is, is dying. You know, the, the sort of local news outfit um, is going away. And so because of that, there's so much um, pressure, basically, on the audience to decide where and when they're going to seek out what they believe is the whole story. It's, it takes work for us. So we can't change the news model. As long as it's corporatized, we can't change it. We can push back and we could use our voice. I think where we can make a difference is um, reducing our own susceptibility to the dehumanizing rhetoric. So for example, if, if, if you hear something you don't like, instead of just turning it off, write something about it, talk about it, um, spearhead a group, um, think about what you'd like the news to be or what you'd like, um, what you're watching. You know, how would you change it if you were the executive producer? Um, it's a very difficult thing to turn around, but it doesn't mean you don't have a voice. Yeah. I want to try to tie together so you, you take any piece of the puzzle to talk about. First, Ross talked about uh, the issue with regard to college. I believe it's now moved its way down to elementary school. Education process starts giving bias information all the way down the food chain, first place. How do you get curiosity back in to schools and others when I went to school, just after the dinosaurs were extinct. Uh, uh, they used to encourage professors with different perspectives. That was called learning. Uh, curiosity was the name of the game. It's not, curiosity is like the food to make you intellectually challenging. It's like exercise, we'd be trying to get kids not to be fat, okay? So you have to, third, monetization. Uh, Alan, who I've said in the meeting for, points out that a lot of this is driven by the fact is you give them what they want or what they pay for. And that trilogy, you have to find a way to break it. How would you, you know, you're right, individuals doing it, but I'll end with this. Where is Walter Cronkite today? You, you know, when he said at the end of the show, and that's the way it happened, on September 21st, you knew that was the truth. Thank you. I actually had the pleasure of interviewing Walter Cronkite in 1995. And you know what question I asked him that he, his twinkling eye said, that's a very good question, Lou. And I was so excited that he thought I asked a good question. You know what question I asked him back in 1995? I said, does, does community even exist anymore? Do we have to redefine community? back in 95, before all of this transpired. So I would ask that question to us again. How do we want to build community? And we do it through symposia, through town halls, through discussions, through living room sessions, through coffee talks, through college campuses, and just keep that conversation wide open. And curiosity is the core of everything. I would even venture to say that it might even be the antidote to polarization, because curiosity changes the brain, changes chemistry, changes the nervous system. Lisa, could you add just a little bit? I loved when you were talking about in, um, in Afghanistan, the, the role of civil society there. And I just wonder if you could add a little bit um, to what uh, Lewis started about this conversation around community and we're consuming media, not just as individuals, but as members of families, of churches, of schools. How can civil society help shape and mediate our understanding of meaning in this polarized environment? Great, great question. Thank you. 
So I think part of the challenge right now is that we have government and media corporations and technology corporations talking to each other about these issues, but civil society has not been very involved. And so that is a lot of the focus of my work. Um, you know, in our communities here in Washington, we have neighborhood watch, right? Where we're watching out for each other. And what I am working with some colleagues on right now is called a digital neighborhood watch. Um, and it's really already in, under, in operation in Latvia and Lithuania, because those countries, they've been flooded with Russian disinformation for over decades, actually. And the community has begun to respond. So they have citizen activists watching for Russian disinformation, naming it, doing a lot of social media literacy, and you know, really working together as civil society to say, this is our community and we're gonna protect it. So the idea for the United States is, you know, we're building a website right now for the Digital Neighborhood Watch, where we all learn how to identify disinformation we're all learning the skills of digital listening. Everybody's speaking on social media, but there's very few sort of listening skills for how do we appreciate and listen and find common ground and the core values that are embedded in somebody else's narrative. So I think we all need to be better and take responsibility for finding common ground, showing dignity, and really sort of restraining in our speech sometimes and, and doing some active listening in conflict resolution where we really are trying to understand, summarize, and find that common ground with somebody else's talk. So, you know, I have a whole list of sort of the components of our new website, but take a look, Digital Neighborhood Watch. It's this idea of civil society taking some responsibility and using some of the skills I think will be in the next workshop on dialogue and, and difficult conversations. Thanks. Good morning, Steve Prost. I, uh, I, hearing the speakers, there's a theme, and I agree with just most of everything that's been said about the ills of our depolarization, our media. We just heard mentioned, uh, we look at the solutions, we've heard uh, we the people, there's things we could do, a digital watch. Uh, to this point in the discussion, it's all been, there's been no government imposed solutions, um, which, I'd, so I'd be interested in hearing maybe the three of you to agree that as terrible as these ills are, they're really ills that need to be solved by, that are, have cultural roots. And that when we start, do you, would you, the three of you agree that we come to government solutions to the loss of our ability to make discerning choices, we're gonna have a greater problem, long-term problem, we get government starting to regulate, let's say, you know, the government saying, let's not use terms that dehumanize. Let's not, use, you're not allowed to use the terms like uh, rip and shred. That when you start excluding the groups on the fringes and, and not allowing them and what, and telling private companies what they can promote and what they can't, uh, someday we could have a dictatorial government making more of those decisions for us. I've heard a lot of solutions that are self-policing communal, maybe nonprofit or even profit ways to, pol to police and help with this problem. Would you all agree that we don't want government imposed solutions? Can I, can I just say a caveat to your question? Can you guys try to answer which is much nuance and specificity as possible? Because that's a great, great question, but it's very broad. So government regulating um, speech is very different than potentially specific government relation, regulations on certain types of media uh, for specific reasons uh, for health or safety. So because that is such a broad and sweeping question, can your answer be as nuanced as possible? Because I recognize that probably none of you are in the camp of there should be all government regulation or there should be no government regulation. Go ahead, Ross. Yeah, yeah. So one of the solutions that's integral to Bridges' mission is really getting people in the room to talk to one another face-to-face -face in a physical space about these things in a neutral way. Um, I'm not someone who thinks that the government should be trying to run neutral conversations. I think that is necessarily um, predisposed to go south. Um, 
any any claim of neutrality is difficult and when it comes from the people who who command the police force I, I'm, I'm skeptical that being said um, there is a lot of um, work going on within democracy reform um, things about campaign finance reform um, different ways to vote like ranked choice voting that lets you instead of put one person lets you list you know I would like this person first this person second um, there's a lot to be said about those solutions to polarization um, you know currently the we have a two-party system the two-party system is is not going away in the near future um, but it does contribute a lot to polarization and allowing for more diverse voices within government and um, people to run without the help of specifically corporate moneyed interests um, I think can there is something to be said for changes within our government that we can make that that will help polarization Yeah, I have two responses because I, I think censorship is a very dangerous thing. I think we can all agree with that. We're here at this First Amendment conference. Um, and I think especially, um, you know, with the technology companies having so much power to decide who gets censored and who doesn't get censored, there's a danger in that. You know, on the left, there's sort of two approaches. One, promoting censorship of white nationalist discourse. And the other saying, actually from history, we know the best way of dealing with violent extremist ideologies is to bring them out in the open and allow for a public discussion of them. Um, so in my town, one of the largest white nationalist radio and TV programs is operating around the world. That tens of thousands of people watch this white nationalist ideology saying, you know, there's an invasion of people of color and there's a white genocide going on. And we're debating as a community, how do we respond to that? Because it's being aired from our community. Um, do we protest, try to shut them down, or do we try to engage with them? Um, what we really need is actually mainstream media to, to really get up close with what is white nationalism, what are these beliefs, what are the facts, and really try to debunk this in public because I think just censoring this is very dangerous. So it, it, we need a whole of society response to these white nationalist views. And just continuing to push them aside is, is not going to be the solution. Um, but so that's part of the civil society government reaction to some of the deplatforming. But I think what we really need to push from technology companies is what's called algorithmic transparency. We need to understand how their algorithms work and what they are amplifying and really distinguish between freedom of speech and freedom of reach and, and recognize that they have a responsibility and they are undermining our democracy by amplifying divisive material. Uh, hi, my name is Nick. Uh, a question I have is about access to uh, the media. Um, so uh, what I've found is uh, particularly uh, poor people, college students, they can easily access Breitbart or Huffington Post, right? But they can't get the New York Times or the Washington Post because they're behind paywalls. Um, what, what can we do to solve that, that, the, the issue of having legitimate journalism separated from this hyper partisan hyper polarized stuff when people can't they just can't afford to subscribe to it that's an excellent point uh writ large demand it take down the paywall demand you know writ large demand it i know it feels like well what can one person do but but i think what you just described is the nuance that you're talking about chelsea Breitbart wants people to access them. And that's in part why they developed such a large audience as well. Um, I wanted to, to pick up a little bit on, on some of the things that had been mentioned too. I think uh, that 
transparency that you're talking about, it's like we as a public need to be able to have this permeability between ourselves and whatever publication uh, we're reading or watching, et cetera. And so the, we, we need to demand a shift from this outrageification culture to, um, in a way, when Steve, you talked about government, yes, uh, agreed, we can't have censorship, but we also have a situation where um, the terms fake news and enemy of the people, which, by the way, Spiro Agnew and Richard Nixon said quite a bit, <laughs> um, but we're hearing it now, and I think what's really slippery is it's not so much that that just uh, destroys trust, but that it creates doubt. And the doubt that's seeping into the culture about what is true, about whose intentions are pure or right, um, I think this is corroding public discourse as well. Um, you know, the AP, who we all think, oh, the Associated Press, they're very neutral, aren't they? When 5,000 people were trying to make their way here from a destabilized and terrifying Central America, the headline that was tweeted out from AP was, an army of migrants. And guess why they deleted it? Because people said, no, you can't say that. So it came from us. And so I think there is something to be said for backlash. There is something to be said from call out culture. I know sometimes we think it goes too far. People say they're triggered about all kinds of things, but I think call out culture um, is interesting. I mean, we never had that before because we didn't have the platform for it. But there, there are a lot of people kind of lassoing or pulling the reins in or saying, nah, -uh, you can't say that about these, this group or that group. Um, so it's not a direct answer, but it's just some thoughts. Yeah. for the, the next generation. So even those younger than Ross, uh, our children who are um, in this space where they're often, um, their lives are unfold on social media from conception. Um, and they're, uh, what is the hope in kind of a pathway? You don't have to have this answer complete clearly in the next three minutes. But I would love for each of the panelists to just, to just comment on one moment of hope or opportunity they see in the midst of this polarization for the next generation? Um, so what I will say is when people, and you've probably most of you have experienced it, when people talk to someone they disagree with um, and it's not just shouting at them online, the people, it's very rewarding to interact with someone that you've been told that you can't interact with. Um, and it's very stimulating and I think people enjoy that emotion more than fear and hatred they might be more wired for fear and hatred, but you actually get more enjoyment out of intellectual stimulation. Um, so get people in these conversations, have these conversations, because I think more people will see that this is a, this is a good route to go down. The second thing I will say about hope in the higher education space is um, administrators are starting to wake up to this. They're starting to be more like centers for freedom of expression or centers for civil discourse. Um, people are starting to see that this is a problem. Um, and so there is hope, but there really is only hope if we do something about it. So please be active. <laughs> I guess uh, just a brief uh, thought to end on is um, just having done a lot of study recently on the promotive factors of resilience. Um, you know, to everybody has a story, and to some extent, you know, we are uh, a, a traumatized world, traumatized nation in, in various degrees. And so how do we promote resilience? And all of the research on resilience over the last 50 years is really clear that it's self-care, it's adaptive coping skills, it's building social systems. People need people, and not necessarily you know, like-minded identity groups and tribes, but the type of social systems that feel like someone's got your back. And then together, making meaning and finding a common sense of purpose that's generative. 
Um, I think in that way we can reach across. In that way we can begin be building new types of scaffolding um, so that we can become curious about each other and understand what we need is not that different from what other people need. Um, so when I think about it that way, uh, hope for me has a, a deeply biological um, imperative. It's like we, we all need safety and we all need connection and we all need to feel that we're working together on something that's meaningful. And I will close with some natural observations or observations about the natural world. And that is, you know, as a religious person, God's design was not for just one kind of creature to live on the earth. There is a broad diversity and it is the diversity in creation that is enriching that, that, you know, different creatures help each other and interact with each other. So we are actually wired to be social and we're wired to appreciate diversity. So I think that gives me hope that actually in all of this polarization, sort of our biological memory is if we look out our window, there's all kinds of people, creatures, nature, and the design of the universe was for that diversity to help each other and to work together. And I think human beings here in this country need to remember that. There's a lot of different ideas in the room. We can appreciate what we can learn from each other. And actually that can feel great, as you said, uh, because if you're having a really respectful dialogue and you're learning about somebody else's experience and ideas, you leave better off. You leave with more information and appreciation for what's around you. <laughs> Wow. I just want to point out, as we're thanking our panelists, that you didn't really learn a lot about our moderator. And she is on our board of directors for First Amendment Voice. She is closer to Ross's age than she is to my age. And that is intentional. And Ross being on his panel is intentional because if we don't hear from younger generations, if they don't have a voice in our governance, then how are we going to know how to shape the future? When Lisa was talking about differences and, and, and uh, Lou asked you where you got your information, I didn't hear anybody say, I get most of my information from YouTube. Younger generations, though, if you see some of the surveys, get the majority of their information from YouTube. Think about those implications. So what an amazing panel. Thank you. You are going to get a chance to interact with them more. I know there were other questions out there. Our speakers are going to the same lunch and breakout sessions that you are, although you're get, you get to choose. Everybody gets to choose. There are two breakout sessions. Kern, please stand up. Kernberry ladies and gentlemen, will facilitate one. Some, some of you have been to his, uh, his difficult conversations workshops before. If you need, have the imperative to go back, you're welcome. But we also have Pete Swanson. Is Pete in the room now? He's downstairs. So Jamie Haig, Jamie, please come up so everybody can see you, or at least move closer to the front of the room. Jamie is going to be downstairs with Pete Swanson. They are from the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service. What that government agency does is they mediate difficult negotiations between labor unions and big corporations. They get in the trenches when there are really contentious issues at stake. And so they are going to give interactive experience in one room and Kern simultaneously will give you a primer because it's not the full blown difficult conversations. You need four to six hours for that. Um, but you are going to get that during your lunch experience. <laughs>